Colin Craig is a respected businessman who has founded and run five successful businesses. Uh, the largest of these is Centurion Management Services, which has grown from being a one-man band to a large employer. With a strong sense of justice and a desire to see his country succeed, it was no surprise that Colin became involved in politics, firstly with local business issues, then with leaky homes. In 2009, shocked at the government's refusal to be directed by the citizens, initiated a referendum supported by over 87 per cent of voters, Colin organised and funded the March for Democracy, seeking to require that our democratically elected government act democratically. In 2010, Colin became involved with looking into the proposed Auckland Super City merger, running polls, making public comment, and subsequently running for mayor and achieving third place in the election. Uh, at the end of, gee, this is a couple of years old, uh, at the end of 2010, Colin launched the Conservative Party of New Zealand, and in the 2011 election scored 2.7 per cent after just how long in existence? Seven weeks. Seven weeks in existence. Yep. So, um, based on inertia, uh, it may be more. Colin, welcome. It's good Thank to you. have you here. Thank you. Um, let me ask you the question that everybody asks me, okay, when they see me and Fly they want to know something about Colin Craig. I don't know why I know the answer, so I'm going to ask you. And that is, are you well? I am. I'm very well. If you're referring to my weight loss, um, <clears throat> yeah, I was a little overweight. And uh, I got myself sorted with a bit of good diet and exercise and managed to lose 30 kgs. And I, I, now weigh, I now weigh what I weighed in my 20s when I was playing competitive cricket. So, yeah. Okay, and how did you do that? Just speak oh, slowly. Oh, yeah, just... Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Right. I'll send you the links. <laughs> Okay, let's get straight into it. I was suggested it. I should write a dieting book, and that would be very good for my political yeah, career, yeah. Well, it would be a good fundraiser. Yeah. Um, okay, let's get straight into it. And um, so let's start with marriage. Um, I yes, mean, obviously, I am. you're I am married. married. I am married. You led the charge. I mean, what I found, found fascinating about the marriage debate was that it was difficult to find anyone in Parliament who was actually willing to speak for traditional marriage, it was left to predominantly you as a politician. Yeah, that was very surprising because actually nobody, it wasn't difficult to find, there just was nobody. Um, and I know you went, uh, interviewed Winston Peters earlier, but look, um, he didn't campaign against, yes his party voted against, um, but they withdrew from every debate on the issue. Um, and I ended up in the limelight talking about marriage, which was a surprise to me. I would have thought we would have had a bit more backbone at the top level and a willingness to engage in a debate about it, and it was disappointing to see. And uh, look, I, I did the best I could, Bob. I think a few learning um, curves there. But um, I was very happy, and still am, that I went centre stage on that, even though I did discover what it is to get death threats and all those other sorts of wonderful things that come along with such a you know, well-measured and, um, you know, understanding perspective from the other side, which didn't always happen. So, uh, yeah, look, it was a big challenge. Mm. Parliament voted two to one in favour of redefining marriage, 1840, yeah. uh, and yet, as I showed the audience before, the polls suggested that the country was completely split down the middle. Yeah. So what is it about... I, I think it shows how out of touch politicians are. But I think it's also, and, and look, I came to understand this better and better as the process went along, the lobbying that goes on um, for, to move the opinion of politicians, the politicians who can't actually just don't want the flack, don't want to be bothered. Mm. Um, one politician who changed his mind uh, was opposing it and then decided to vote for it on the day was telling me how clever he thought he was because the following day all those who were on the internet mm were giving him congrats because they knew he'd changed his mind and voted to redefine marriage and all the old folk who hadn't caught up with it he thought he was still in their camp and he was getting their congratulations too and he thought that was hilarious. Uh, I just didn't, I saw it as a wee bit more of a major issue than that. I didn't think it was something that should be treated that lightly and I was very disappointed in a lot of the speeches which were like, oh well I don't know how this will affect me so therefore I'm going to vote for it. And I th thought that we should have had um, more considered votes than that, because this was something that's fundamental to our nation and our society. Mm. And frankly, if all you're thinking about is your own marriage, I wonder why you're there. 
So if you're in a position of being able to influence after the election, uh, what are you willing to do in terms of marriage? Are you willing to fight to get it restored? To the oh, I'd love definition? to. I'd love to. And it's not, for me, it's not going to go away. Uh, for those people who made false promises about it not affecting anything, we know it does. Um, it's affected churches and other associations where they make their buildings available to the public. It's affected adoption from Russia, which has now been shut down because they don't agree with gay parenting. Um, it, it's affected celebrants and other people already, and we know that over, the overseas says that this will just be an ongoing effect. Mm. So for me, it's not a dead issue, it's a live issue, and I'd still love it to get it out to the people of the country in a referendum. Yeah, well, that's what I was just going to ask. Would the Conservative Party put it to a referendum? Yeah, if we get a that binding up. referendum. Absolutely. What if you lost it? Well, if we lose it, we lose it. Uh, but we're certainly not going to get a change with the politicians that we have right now. Uh, and so I think our best, our best hope and where we can get leverage is to get it out to the people. Failing that, we can amend what we've got and at least start making some changes like giving genuine conscience choice to celebrants for a starter. Mm. Mm. So I think there are other things we can do, but I, I'd like to get rid of it wholesale. Yeah, we haven't had the, the, the bakers and the photographers and the florist examples just, just yet. No, but I think as you pointed out earlier today, we have had the homestay and we will see more and more of that going along because there are people who live in a political activist mm. space around gay issues. Yeah. And um, they, they'll be on the lookout for those bakers, florists and everyone else that they can make an issue of. And charities. And charities, that's true. Do you think, how, well how likely do you think it is that we're going to see a bill to introduce group marriage, you know, to just extend the definition well, further? Oh, look, the discussion's already out there. Uh, in my lifetime, I think it's a certainty that we'll see that come up. Whether we see that in the next three years, I don't know, but I think we have to recognise there are people who are lobbying for that already. Mm. The discussion's out there. Uh, inevitably, it's going to come around, and if we've got the same sort of quality of people in Parliament as we've got right now, it could well get through. As I shared earlier, the marriage rate has been constantly dropping. My, my mm. premise is, or thesis is that as the marriage rate drops, we will see social uh, harm increase. Yeah. Do you think marriage is something that we need to put time and investment, uh, government support, you know, $200 pre-marriage counselling vouchers? Is that the type of thing you want to see happen? I'd love to see that happen. I, I think we need to say that holding marriages together is not purely the domain of politicians, and in fact, <laughs> many politicians are a great example of what not to do. Um, they are not the best role models. Uh, I've been happily married for 23 years and will continue to be happily married. Um, but not everyone has that commitment. And I think that there is a social um, difficulty where we've got where people are losing their own values and their own perspectives uh, and maybe even learning from their own parents how to do relationships. That's not something government can solve all the pieces of. But I think there are a couple of key things. Number one is, yes, we have to approach relationships differently. We should invest in keeping marriages together because that's by far the cheapest option um, rather than having them come apart. I think we should change the family court. I've never thought that arming both mum and dad with lawyers and sending them into you know, combat to the death is actually good for ongoing harmony. Uh, I much prefer that we just said, hey, you got 50%, wife's got 50%, and that's how it goes. And maybe you can work something out between you, maybe you can get somewhere through some sort of mediation, but I'm really not seeing how may arming everyone with lawyers works. Mm. Uh, the other thing is tax. I mean, obviously we have a tax system that doesn't recognise any sort of income splitting, which mm. is unusual. Most countries in the OECD do, and so I think that's a no-brainer as well. And I guess also benefits. You know, why would we give someone that's saying they're solo, but is living with others, mm. um, more support than we would give to a married person. That, to me, doesn't stack up either. Okay. <clears throat> can we um, just touch on the good thing is that, unlike Winston, you haven't got the list of questions, so I can go all over the place. You, you can. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realise I was meant to pre-write <laughs> answers and read them out, otherwise I would have come from Ped Bomb. Um, let's just touch on the citizens initiated referendum, because obviously yep. you're a big supporter. You organised a march yep. to highlight the fact that the government has ignored the yep. last four or five. Yep. What's your design for a citizens-initiated referendum? Okay. Are you talking about 50% over the line, 10% petition? Right. 
Let's, um, first of all, I, un, unlike Winston Peters and I did hear his interview, so I guess that gives me a bit, of, a bit of an advantage. I am happy to tell you what our bottom line is. I see no problem with letting people know. Um, there is, it is only 11 weeks till the election and people do want to start thinking about it. Um, our bottom line is that referendum will become binding. That's both government initiated and citizens initiated. And I believe that citizens have the right to take any issue to referendum, not just some social issue that would be a conscience vote of politicians. I do think, and our, our policy is that the threshold to get one of those across the line should be the same threshold, same number of um, voters as it is to get a party into parliament, which is basically 5% of the vote. Mm. Uh, so that's what you need to get a referendum there. Um, in terms of binding on government, we say it's got to achieve two thirds of those who vote. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the history of referendum in New Zealand, that would mean we would have reformed law and order, we would have less MPs, we wouldn't have the anti-smacking law, and we would have stopped the asset sales. So that's a bottom line for you to be in coalition? That is that our bottom line to give support and confidence and supply to another party. And it's not limited to any issue? I mean, for example, we could probably get a petition going here that the tax rate should be 5%. Yeah, uh, two things. Number one is if you want to make a financial change, you have to explain how it's funded and, um, or what you're going to cut. And I don't think anyone would support that, and it's never been proposed anywhere in the world for good reason. Uh, I think that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, so uh, you've got to explain where it comes from. And secondly, you've got to win the confidence of the people of the country. Mm. And I have great faith in the people of the country. Uh, they don't make mistakes nearly as often as politicians do. Mm. There's something about, you know, 61 politicians can get through a piece of legislation, but if you're talking about a million voters, uh, which is what you had wanting to get rid of the anti-smacking law. Um, it's actually a bit harder to get a, for a million people mm. to get it wrong. Mm. Let's talk about the anti-smacking law, and I've got a few questions here, but look, let me just turn it over to you. Tell us what you think about it. What are you going to do about it? Okay. Well, let's start at the beginning. I vote in that referendum. Um, and yeah, and great acknowledgement to Larry, who you've already recognised, and you, Bob, and others who fronted that campaign. Uh, I voted in it. I was tragically disappointed that John Key felt he could just um, say stuff you and, and go ahead. Uh, that, that upset me um, and it motivated me to do something about it, which may be a good thing. Um, the, my view is this. I've always thought that discipline is part of a parent's role. I think to take that out of a family and to put parents um, in a position where they're held hostage by their kids is incredibly stupid. And it's happening. I mean, I, I, I get, because, as you know, the media have made me, you know, the poster boy for smacking, which I, I what do I get called publicly this year? You know, New Zealand's biggest advocate for smacking. Well, <laughs> I don't think I am that, but I certainly think that it should be um, allowed. I think that the increase in child abuse since the introduction of the law shows it hasn't worked. On average, there's two police investigations a week of good parents, and I think those resources should be targeted at the abusers. What they did in Australia was they worked out who was doing the abuse and they targeted those individuals and they reduced child abuse. That's not rocket science. So for me it's a case of get rid of the law altogether and probably replace it with the same one they have in New South Wales and Australia which is very effective, um, quite sensible and would just put at rest all the doubts that parents have about <coughs> their role in disciplining their children. Okay, so. Uh, when we've approached you for a statement on this for our value your vote resource, it has basically by, uh, the statement has been provided we have sufficient numbers, yep. changes to this law will be a bottom line. Yep. So you will not enter into a coalition unless John Key or... As long as we've got the numbers, I mean we have to understand in an MMP environment, um, if we don't have enough votes to be able to demand something, then it won't happen. So, um, you know, we're making binding referendum our bottom line. I would like to think that that would then mean an automatic acknowledgement mm. of those referendum, that, you know, five of them, that the people of New Zealand have already agreed to. I think it would be ridiculous to, for National to say, OK, we'll give you binding referendum, but by the way, you need to rehold the smacking referendum. I think that would be incredibly insane. It's not to say that that wouldn't happen, um, but if it did happen, I would happily fund it, front it, and go out there and get the people of New Zealand all over again 
to send an absolutely clear message to John Key that this law has to change, and he'd be bound by that. So you may not have the numbers, but you may have the clout. I mean, Act, Act in United Future didn't have the numbers, but they had the clout to be able to squeeze out yep. um, uh, uh, the schools, the Act schools, I can't remember what they're called. Charter schools. Charter schools. Yeah. Uh, United Future squeezed out income splitting, even though nothing's happened. So it may not be a numbers game, it may actually be a clout game. It's a difference between whether someone wants to be Prime Minister or not, depending on whether they've got your support. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're quite clear, we're quite clear about mm -hmm. our bottom line, make no apologies for it. I think that we've got to change the dialogue in the country and politics to make it more about what the people want, and that will stop the, some of the silly social engineering, liberal stuff that's coming through, which the public don't support. Mm. Um, but politicians do. John Key says that he doesn't want to get into a debate where basically you're just labelled as the adult who wants to whack your kids. Well, I, I, look, I think the mandate is the people of New Zealand. It's not John Key's decision, is it? If he says, I will abide by what the people of New Zealand want, it's not a debate about whether he is mandating anything. It's simply a case that the people of the country have made a decision. Hmm. And I think that's the strongest ground that a politician in a democracy can ever be on. Let's move on. Uh, drinking age. Um, where do you sit on the, the drinking age but also the five plus solution of mm. raising the price, raising the age, reduce the accessibility, the drink driving and the advertising? Uh, well look, alcohol a huge problem in our society and um, shortly artificial highs will join that list. I know that National have delayed it by 18 months which is a fine move to get past the election without having to have that debate. But nonetheless um, those five things all make sense. Uh, I disagree entirely with Winston Peters. I don't know why poverty is a reason to provide alcohol cheaper than bottled water to families, frankly. Um, we have an approach with smoking in this country that says if you want to buy a packet of cigarettes, you pay the tax associated with the cost of health treatment and so on. I think the same approach should apply to alcohol. That means we have to raise the price because right now, that stuff is subsidised hugely, it's a loss leader. People buy it and consume it in copious amounts and do themselves and society a lot of harm. And we have to be very clear. Alcohol overconsumed is dangerous. It's dangerous for individuals, it's dangerous for kids and families, and we know that it underlines, uh, takes up the majority of police time in terms of assaults and other violent acts. We also know that it's taking 60 to 70 per cent of our accident emergency resources. Mm. And that's a huge cost that puts a law-abiding citizen who's got a need on hold because someone else has abused a substance that they were buying dirt cheap. And the drinking age? Oh, absolutely, should go up. And the purchasing age, purchasing mm. drinking age okay. um, up. There's no question that when we lowered it, we did an enormous amount of harm, and I have no <laughs> doubt the public support it being put up again, as does every police every medical professional, every expert on the subject that I have talked to, unequivocally clear. We spent millions of dollars on a report by the Law Commission that said this is what should happen. It's only the politicians who are having trouble understanding that. Uh, the Greens have a... Um, <laughs> the Greens have a private member's bill to allow same-sex adoption, uh, whether they're married or not. It's you know, mm. extended beyond what the... Louisa Wall's bill is already allowed. Uh, in terms of adoption, do you support or oppose a bill which would allow adoption by same-sex couples where one of the parent isn't the biological parent? Mm. Well, look, we've already um, entered into this debate because in redefinition of marriage, that changed adoption as well. And I was amazed the media didn't really want to go there very much. Um, and neither did those proposing the bill. Uh, I've always made mm. it really clear that I believe that um, adoption is about finding a home for a child with a mum and a dad. And I think that's the bottom line. And the way I came to that was I was thinking, you know, 15 or 20 years from now, when I'm looking that child in the face, I want to be able to say I was the person that argued for them to have a mum and a dad. And, you know, I just, I, I can't get past that. It's, it's just the natural order of things. You know, a mum and a dad, you cannot have better than a mum and a dad who loves you. And I just think that's what we should be looking for if we're going to do the best for the child. I don't care about the adults and what they think their rights are. I actually care about what we're doing for a child. Euthanasia? Where do you stand on decriminalisation of euthanasia? Yeah, well, uh, look, as a political party, we have written into our principles the value of life. 
and I think it's a tragedy if we go down the track of thinking that assisting suicide is an answer. Palliative care, do you think we need to do more work in the palliative care area? I think we can, and if the argument for you know, assisted suicide and making docs, doctors executioners, which I mentioned recently at a high school and all the kids were horrified that I'd use that language, um, but I said, well, what is it otherwise? Um, look, I think when we get to that point where people are suffering, we just don't need to be there. We have the technology, we have drugs and other mechanisms for ensuring that people don't suffer, and I think we should make sure that no one is ever suffering unnecessarily. Mm. I also think that very important in the care of um, those who are at that end of life is a real connection to people, and I'd love to see more emphasis on help, you know, helping families understand that being by the bedside and spending a bit of time with you know, grand, granddad matters. Mm. Mm. And I think that would be much healthier. And there's something that can be passed on. I, I got a lot from my grandparents. Um, loved them to bits. Sorry to see them go. Um, but I have part of my life as a legacy of what they had to offer. And I got some of that from particularly one grandmother and one granddad on their deathbeds. And I might have missed that if there'd been mm. some you know, trigger-happy oh, gee, you're costing us a lot of money and you're suffering, why don't you sign a form? We've just heard from Hillary about what it's like to be a parent and for your children to be whisked away for an abortion yeah. without you being told. You would change that law if you could? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'd change it if I could, absolutely. I'd propose it. I think it's long overdue that we recognise that um, an exception to what is otherwise a generally accepted principle, which is that parents or guardians are consulted around the medical issues of children simply shouldn't be made uh, on this issue. It shouldn't be made on any issue. When did we think that separating children from their parents was the smart way to go? It's not. It's another breakdown of what I believe uh, is the basic institution of society, which is the family. You start getting the law in there and prying apart those relationships and isolating a child in a particular circumstance, which could be a difficult one. It's just not the right way to go. In the value your vote uh, in 2011, I think you got in a bit of trouble because uh, one of the questions we asked was, does the unborn child have a right to life? And yeah, was that the exact wording? I think it was, would you support legislation? I think Giving an unborn child the right to yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. put undecided. Yeah, I did. And in this year's one that we're about to release, You've yeah. put, yes, you would support it. Yeah. What's changed? Well, I think the understanding of the questions changed because the first time that came out, I was looking around the world going, OK, where have they got legislation along these lines? And Poland, which is a 97% Catholic country, was trying to get legislation through to that effect, and they were having a lot of difficulties around the legalities of it. So I looked at it very much strictly on the wording and not so much on the principle. Um, now I'm, now I'm looking at it in terms of principle and saying, well, I, I absolutely support an unborn child's right to life and always have. That hasn't changed, mm. but I think the way I'm looking at the question has changed and that I'm seeing it not so much as a can you practically imagine that we could get legislation in this country to that effect. It's, it's more principle. a principled answer to say this is where I do stand. So wh what do you think about the... I mean, I probably know what you think about it, but how, how are, you, are you going to respond to the Greens' proposal to decriminalise abortion? Well, look, I was already, I mean, I've been inter interviewed on TV about that, and, and I just said, look, I think that's a crazy extreme suggestion. Um, I think that we already have too many abortions, and I think that anyone in their right mind would hopefully have the ideal that we should reduce those, and hopefully get rid of them altogether, although I think that's a utopian view. I don't think we could achieve that, but we certainly can achieve a dramatic reduction, and that's a life saved every time, and I... Um, for me, that's huge, and I think that those, and I'm, I'm imagining some people here probably work in that field, um, and I've always thought of it like this. If, if we could reduce abortions by 1,000 a year, and 20 years down the track, you put every one of those kids in a room, you'd have 20,000 people there who would otherwise have died. Mm. And I think when you think like that, it, it makes it really clear where we should be. Okay. What about in terms of uh, pre-screening? Uh, for gender selection, for Down syndrome, for cleft yeah. palate, like in the UK? Oh, no, no, look, I'm not a favour in that because I think all you're doing is then giving people more reasons to go there. Um, I mean, and I know in some countries they, you know, it's all well, male, female, and 
males are more important, so let's ditch the females. I'm not sure there are any countries where they do it the other way around yet, mm. although if feminism keeps going, you never know, Bob. You never know. But um, no, look, I, I think it's just such a dangerous place to go. I think we do want to know if the mother's health is going to be compromised. That, for me, is what pre-screening should be about. Mm. It should be about, is this healthy? Are we all going well and we're on track? Mm. Because there are times where medical intervention is necessary, and I think that's what medicine <laughs> should be focused on, is preserving life, both mother and child. The marijuana, there's going to be uh, attempts to decriminalise marijuana. We're going to perhaps follow some US states. Where do you stand on that? Oh, well, <laughs> I think it's a stupid idea, um, and I think most jurisdictions where they've liberalised drug laws have figured that out now. Uh, I, th I think, I doubt that marijuana will be um, decriminalised at this stage. I think the legal highs is actually our first battlefield. Um, and, you know, slick footwork by National have seen that go on the back burner for 18 months. And, of course, when it, 18 months from now, when they've got their, uh, you know, testing criteria, I think they called it, sorted out, um, it'll be introduced and it's in the middle of an election cycle and that's how these things get done. And I think it's very disappointing. Um, of course, if there's binding referenda, the beauty of it is we'll be able to take this to the people of the country. And I imagine we will stop it. What, what about the argument for decriminalisation of marijuana, that it's a health issue, that the war on drugs hasn't worked, that we're tying up copious amounts of police time? Um, you, well, we're not really. And I don't know this war on drugs. I mean, <laughs> gee, you know, it's pretty much been a peaceful fly the white flag from where I'm sitting. I don't know how hard we've made it, really. <laughs> Goodness me, I know where we can go in Auckland and find plenty of people that are smoking it and handing it out. Um, the reality is, uh, if there's a genuine argument at a medical level, fine. Prescribe it like we prescribe other drugs through doctors. That doesn't require legalisation, doesn't require any change to the law. And we already actually do have artificial THC, which does effectively the same thing as the real stuff. You just have to get it prescribed through a medical professional for medical, genuine medical reasons. That's our safeguard on drugs in this society. Mm. Drugs have to go through an authorised channel, and that way we restrict, we don't always stop the abuse of medic medicinal drugs, but we, we stop. Mm. I think the argument, I mean, it, it, the statistics and the research for me is very clear. It's a gateway drug, it does mental harm, marijuana or artificial highs, you know, legal highs. Um, they are medical risk, a huge medical risk. I've now talked to health professionals who are having to deal with people who turn up and they've got symptoms that they can't figure out because there's some chemical combination of chemical compounds putting that life at risk. So I, I think it's a no-brainer. I believe a good society is a society where you actually have rules around those things that do harm to people and society. Mm. I mean, we'd never sit here and say, oh, yeah, let's legalise murder because we believe in personal freedom. And I don't believe we should sit here and go, oh, let's legalise intoxicated driving because that's personal freedom. No, it's not. It puts someone else at risk. And we are simply putting far too many people at risk if we liberalise our drug laws. Mm. Decriminalisation of prostitution, would you have voted for that? Oh, of course not. Who wants their daughter to go out and be a prostitute? Does anyone really believe that that's a sensible career option? I think, for me, I can't believe that we did it. In a country that gave women the vote, we're now turning around saying, oh, and by the way, we think a career option is to be a prostitute. And why on earth didn't we outlaw pimping? To think that someone can make a profit out of the exploitation of somebody else, for me, is just unbelievable. And I can't believe we ever did it, and we should change it. Is there, um, in terms of uh, Conservative Party policy, do you want to reverse it so that we prosecute the buyer, or do you want to sort out uh, residential brothels and street prostitution. Well, look, in our submission <coughs> on the Auckland prostitution in specified places um, bill, uh, we made it clear that we think the right model is to actually prosecute the buyer um, and help the woman, because in most cases it's not a choice. I um, mean, you know, there are circumstances in some people's lives that lead them to do awful things. Um, that's not to say you get a free pass, but it's simply saying we've got to recognise that you've got to create pathways out of those situations, mm. and very often the woman is controlled, a lot of gang involvement, um, and the legalisation of it hasn't stopped and at all 
gang involvement, mm. we've got more trafficking and these sorts of, which I think is outrageous, we should be absolutely mm. against it, mm. it does great harm. SIPS Complaints Authority, do you think we need an independent one? Of course we do, one? yep, no Why, problem On what that. basis do you say that? Well, I, you know, I, the, earlier this year on, an, on a radio interview I admitted that I smacked my daughter from time to time, which of course we now know after today's documentary is just not always the smart thing to do. I was really pleased that the police said, well, we're not going to invest Colin, investigate Colin Craig in an election year, which was special treatment when you think about it. If it wasn't an election year and it wasn't me, they would have, <coughs> which I think we need to put a question mark after that myself. Um, SIFS did, however, decide to have a little poke around, and I've also um, had a number of people who have come to me with SIFS issues. They do have an incredibly difficult job. They are dealing with some of the very, very awful situations in our society which make my hair, hair stand on end, and it's pretty tough, and some good people involved. But the fact of the matter is they can get it wrong. The fact of the matter is that they have a lot of power, actually, in law, and with those sorts of power, that sort of power, you need a lot of safeguards. Mm. I mean, the police have less power than SIFs in many situations mm. when it comes to children and the care mm. of children. So mm. I think a safeguard makes absolute sense and I think it would do a lot of good for SIFs mm. to know that there's some oversight, independent oversight, which starts to look at some of their processes and recommend changes. Mm. Just back to that uh, economic issue, we, I think we touched on paid parental leave and income splitting. Yep. So Conservatives support both those concepts? Yeah, paid parental leave, it's a case of how we fund it, because economically you know, we're a wee bit um, up the creek. We've borrowed more money than ever before in the last five years, faster than ever before, and we now have a huge debt. And I don't see debt, as some people do, as, oh, that's out there, we don't need to worry about but it. But is it something that we needed to do to get through the recession? No, I don't believe so. Certainly other countries didn't do the borrowing at the rate we did. Um, most households and businesses simply tightened their belts, cut a bit of spending, um, that's what most governments did. Ours didn't. It decided that it would be a great time to borrow up and spend. Mm. And I just don't agree with that approach. I think we needed to mm. tighten our belt. That's what you do when you have less coming in the door. You have to start spending less, not spending more. Okay, so the argument for paid parental leave and income splitting is that you support families to have a bit more choice as to allowing a parent to be at home during well, those I, early years. Yeah, look, I think we've got to recognise that there's a lot of value in a family structure and that in fact a mother who, and it's mostly mothers, but not always, um, the mother who stays at home and looks after particularly preschool children is doing such a tremendous good for our society. Mm. But we don't recognise that at the moment. Mm. In fact, if you want paid parental leave, you have to have been working. Mm. You know, it's, uh, and that's amazing. What we're really saying is, well, as long as you're out there working and walking the treadmill of a job, then we're on your side. Mm. But there's no help for you at all mm. if you want to dedicate yourself to being a mother at home. And I think that's wrong. I think we've far too, for far too long um, taken for granted those women, and occasional men, who make that commitment to raise kids. That's got such huge value for our society. All the research says they will be better, better citizens mm. for us. Um, and look, I disagree entirely with the government's approach that says they want 98% of children in childcare, and they will fund childcare centres, but they won't fund a parent at home to do the same job, mm. even though, in most cases, they do it better. Mm. One of the criticisms against paid parental leave uh, that I hear is, if people want to have babies, go for it, but don't expect the state to have to bail you out. Well, look, what we've done is we've said we're, you know, in this country, we're paying for early childhood education. We've said we want 98% of children, which is effectively all of them, in early childhood education. We're funding that. We've made a decision as a nation to fund that, and it does make a lot of sense. Uh, in fact, from my point of view, education in the early years is worth about three or four times what education in the later years is worth. Those first five years of a child's life are the absolute, if you like, pointing of the compass in the direction that child will go. And to not invest in that, but to be prepared to spend 20 grand a year for someone to study some useless degree at university, um, 
boggles belief. In, in terms of common sense, we've got to get the money where it matters, and it matters in those early years. Now, if we're prepared and if we've accepted that we're going to put all that money into early childhood education, why would we fund a daycare but not fund a parent at home looking after a child? That, to me, makes no sense when we know the statistical evidence is in, on the side of the parent that com commits to stay at home and look after those kids. Just briefly, are you concerned about broadcasting standards, sexualisation of children in the media? I don't know if you were here in time to hear Maggie speak earlier, but... Um... No, I, I actually missed that. Um, I, I absolutely am. I think where we are with standards in our society is hugely problematic. Um, part of the solution, I think, is that we need to set some concrete rules instead of leaving it up to the arbitrary judgement of judges or panels who look at well, what's the norm? And their norm may not be the norm. It certainly might not what be what a sensible parent wants their child to be exposed, exposed to. So our policy is that we believe all public spaces, and that includes the television um, and, the internet. and the internet, should be G-rated. Now, what they've done in the UK is they've started um, something with the internet whereby they have adult access. So if, in fact, if a child wants to get onto the internet, it requires an adult to let them in. So the default is G-rated? The default is G-rated. And I actually believe that's the right way to go. Mm. And I think anyone who knows the research around what children are looking at and by what age, um, it's frightening and we have to mm. do something. And I do believe public spaces should be G-rated and that should be the norm. Mm. Do you support the three strikes? Winston made an interesting point uh, that why do we wait for the second and third strike and create more victims? Yeah, look, uh, the reason we've got the third strikes is, of course, because we don't treat crime seriously enough right now. Having said that, it does work. Uh, and I'd rather have it in place than not have it at all. Mm. But what we are pushing for, two things. Number one is higher um, minimum sentences for violent crime, in absolute. And secondly, no discounted justice. I do not understand why we give some 10 years and they walk out, out after seven. That makes no sense to me. Um, the, the repeat offending rate in this country is 80 per cent plus. Um, violent crime, it's 50 per cent re-offend within four years. I think we've got it really wrong if we think the idea of catch and release is actually taking us there. It's simply not. It's simply recycling them out there to do more harm. And we've got the same problem with bail. We're letting people out on bail who are an absolute risk to society. And there are you know, murders, brutal assaults, and all sorts of other problems that are happening because of that. I think I'm a, I'm a, law, I'm a tough law and order person. I believe that we've got to look after those people who choose to be law abiding. Loan sharks, um, you know, people have suggested a cap on interest rates as one should of the have key one. things. Yeah, should have one. I mean, the US have gone there, Australia's gone there. The UK will get there, they're having round three of trying to solve their problem with cash loans. Um, they call them payday loans over there. What a fiasco that is. They'll end up with an interest cap. We should have ended up with an interest cap. Mm. If a certain politician who had promised he would put one in place had stuck to it, um, then we would have had one. Would you have voted for the Sky City pokey deal? Absolutely not. Do you want a sinking lid policy on gaming machines? Yes, there should be one. Um, I think that's the right way to go, and I don't believe that we should ever do deals to let people out of those sorts of arrangements. Um, effectively, if you can go and back-channel with the government to circumvent a law, I think we've got a problem. It shouldn't work like that. Liberalisation of uh, Easter trading, what do you think there? Yeah, we, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, people can hop on the internet and buy something if they really can't do without shopping for one day. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think we, we recognise there's a need for certain places to be open, like the gas station and, and so on, and I think that's fair enough. But I don't see the need to take away the few holidays we've got left. Mm. What fascinated me was that, um, and I think, it was an interesting question with Winston Peters watching his reaction, is that nobody has ever attacked Anzac Day, suggesting no. that we do away with that day. Uh, no. It, it's, it seems to have the real focus on um, Easter for some reason. Well, I think there's probably two answers to that. One is, we're, we're, as a population, <coughs> we're growing more in love with Anzac Day. We're starting mm. to recognise that's part of our history and our culture that's very mm. important. And so it's becoming less and less easy to, to mm. push it on that particular day. 
but I think the other one is a commercial reality. Easter's a long weekend, right? And on long weekends, people spend a lot of money. Yeah. And I think it's driven commercially. Yeah. Mm. Two quick questions that aren't on your sheet, so I apologise for that. I haven't got the sheet, Bob, no, no, so no, you're, okay. you're, you're all right. Because <laughs> we did supply all the questions in advance, so no surprises. But uh, we were covering off with both John Key and Winston Peters about the issue of income inequality, yep. child poverty, breakfast in schools. Where do you stand on that? Have we got a growing inequality um, problem in New Zealand? And if so, how do we deal with it? Well, first of all, all Western nations have a growing amount of inequality, and that's primarily because technology and a growing free trade and world market enables people to make bigger and bigger profits if they happen to be in, in you know, a successful business. So you know, once upon a time when your really successful person would have a higher income, they would have you know, a moderately higher income, maybe a factor of three or four or five, but now, of course, it's much higher than that. We actually have far less inequality than other countries, um, developed countries. For me, it's not about whether someone succeeds or not. It's about the person who's trying to get by in society and working hard, and can they make it. I don't really care about somebody who's you know, been a hugely successful entrepreneur on the world stage making a lot of money. For me, that's not really the question. The question is, is there someone who's going out and working really hard who can't get by? Mm. And the answer is actually yes, there is. And that's why, for us, we've got to start looking at tax and saying, well, we, why do we tax people from the first dollar they earn? I mean, Australia doesn't. Their tax-free threshold's 18,700. The UK doesn't. In New Zealand dollars, their tax-free threshold's 20,000. So why are we so mean on our people who are at the bottom end? I mean, we had a tax cut. We give a lot and we back, gave it though, to the rich. We? we do. But we had a tax cut, and we gave it to the very top end. Now, that was nice for people like me. But the reality is, the people that actually needed the help the most mm. and needed the break the most were those who are on a lower income and you know, they're working pretty hard, sometimes two or three jobs, and trying to feed a family. Mm. So I think we do have to address that because it is a problem. As a nation, we're growing poorer. As a nation, we're working longer for less. And that's a serious issue, and it goes back to e economic productivity using our resources and using our technology better. Do you agree in principle, therefore, with what National has attempted to do with welfare reform, accountability, drug testing, uh, work? Um, I, I, do, I do in principle. I think it was an unusual approach to reform welfare and spend an extra $450 million, um, which we didn't have. Um, like if they left it alone, it would have been cheaper. Now, the argument is that in the long run they're going to save money, but I know that most government programs that in the long run are going to achieve things actually never do, and they never get tested either. I mean, we, do, we forget about those mm. things. We never go back and say, oh, we proposed this policy and we told everyone it would save a billion dollars. Has it? We don't do that. I think we should. It would, give us, it would open our eyes, actually, to realise that most of the things that we predict don't pay off. Mm. Mm like all those free trade agreements that are going to be wonderful for us, and then when we actually do the mass, we figure out that they're not. Mm. The one question I didn't put on your sheet, but I'm fascinated to ask you, because I guess you've had the experience, you've done property management. Mm. House across the road from us, the framing's just going up on it now. It's about to be covered by a massive white tarpaulin, leaky building, family's just moved out, terrible. Yep. What is the solution to the leaky building problem, and who ultimately was responsible? Well, look, I've got over a thousand clients with leaky homes. Um, I spend a lot of time looking at not just our problem, but how they handled it in Canada. And I think the Canadians got it right. They had a Royal Commission, and within five years they had their solution. And their solution was the government provided reconstruction loans for every home to be repaired immediately so that they stopped the damage. Because, you know, the longer you leave it, the more expensive it becomes. And then they said, OK, now we're going to work out who's responsible. And for the most part, that rested on com large commercial interests um, who ultimately got the design wrong or implemented the build wrong. In New Zealand, we've made such a meal of it. Um, oh, for goodness sakes, I was going to say a bull's up there. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, we made such a meal of it. We really did. Um, we got it terribly wrong. And, um, look at, and we've said to people they've got 10 years to come back to us and, and tell us about their home. It took the government 13 years with all their experts to even change the law. I don't know why we think people will do it in 10, and it's a very crafty way of avoiding the responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, the government's 
suppose called solution to this is they'll pay 50%. Well, take them to court and you'll get 80. You know, so why, why is that a solution? It's a tragedy. It's a man-made disaster, which in fact has probably cost us a generation of wealth, around about $30 billion. I think in, in all these questions, there's people probably sitting here thinking, Colin, you've got great answers. I like where you're coming from. But the question is, is a vote for the Conservatives a wasted vote? Mm. What if you don't get across the 5%? Well, first of all, I want to say very genuinely that um, I couldn't vote for another political party. And I came to the point of realising that voting for somebody that didn't hold the values that I hold and wasn't going to do something for the country that I wanted them to do was a wasted vote. Whether they, they might get into parliament, but if I supported them to get there and they were going to do the wrong thing, that's a wasted vote. Mm. I felt that I'd reached a point in my own life where if I voted for somebody that at least stood for the things that I agreed with, that was a vote that counted, whether or not they got into parliament or not. Mm. So, you know, I started on that basis going, OK, well, I need a party that I can vote for. Um, I, I do think that we are in a strange system because it is difficult to get 5%. Um, no party has ever done it without having an MP in parliament first through one of the big parties, um, except for the Greens, but then, of course, they were helped over the line by... Um, Labor, who stood aside and said, well, you guys win Coromandel, and Jeanette Fitzsimons got in, and all was well with them. Um, so look, it, it is a challenge. It's a big challenge. Uh, I don't believe it's a waste of vote, because I think the things we stand for are the right things for New Zealand. We may see National make an accommodation with us, which means that we're guaranteed to be in Parliament. I don't think that changes the value of a vote. Do you agree with what Winston said, though, that if you can't get 5%, it shows you're really not cutting it? Actually, no, I don't, because uh, I think that threshold's too high. It always has been too high. The Royal Commission didn't recommend 5%. But what it has meant is that Labour and National, who will never agree to lower it, um, get to decide who they let into Parliament. It's a very controlled system. Um, and 5%'s a lot of votes to win. Now, we believe we can do that. If we do, we'll be the first party ever to have done that without starting out with some, an MP in Parliament. Mm. Back in uh, 2002, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed that the Conservative vote went to United Future. It did, I think. I, yeah. And it seems to me that the Conservative Party is in a similar situ situation to what the Conservatives were at, to United Future were in 2002. Mm -hmm. What have you learnt from the experience of 2002, which has dwindled away to nothing, mm. that will prevent the Conservatives going down the same track? Yeah, look, that's a good question, and I need, I need to say I voted for United Future, and um, I was tragically disappointed with where it all ended up for two reasons. Number one, the leader of that party uh, made an agreement with Helen Clark. Uh, I think the bottom line in terms of, well, great, let's get a com commissioner for children or families commissioner, I'm unsure of the exact title. The guy's written me a letter a couple of times complaining about things like you know, having a march for, um, around democracy when we're talking about the anti smack and other things. So it's just been annoying to me. Um, and, and I look at that and I think, well, what are your bottom lines and what are you asking for? You've got to think that very carefully. And second thing, you must be consistent to what you promise to do. And, and I think the tragedy of United Future has a lot to do with that. It has a lot to do with their leader and where he pitched himself and ultimately what he's ended up voting for. And I think that the lesson for me is, number one, know what you're going in as a bottom line and make sure it's fail-proof. And I think binding referendum is fail-proof as much as anything can ever be. At least if we get it wrong, we all get it wrong as a country, and not just one MP or two MPs tipping the balance. And secondly, we just have to be very consistent. And that's why our policies are what we genuinely believe is good for the country. They are principled, and we will stick to them. And I'm not a career politician, so I don't have to jump around all over the place to keep a job. Mm. For me, this is a pay cut, but it's about doing something that I believe will be good for the country. Would you show your appreciation to Colin Craig? Thank you, Bob. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. I'll join your stage, sir. Fantastic.